Um, dames en heren, ladies and gents, before we continue, this, uh, this conference today is about the future. Uh, the only person who really knows the future is God. So if you want to know what's going to happen, you best you, uh, you start with the man upstairs. To do that for us, I'm going to ask you, Rita, to please open with prayer. Here is groot, he is almachtig, and I know you out of my ear gas, today by Samex and Macadamia Dag to be is. I will be fra om ons presenters te sien, hulle rustigheid te gee, en dat hulle moet praat soos wat u wil hee, moet hulle praat. Dat die gehoor sy oore oopwees vir hulle, en dat ons sal leer uit die sessies uit. En waar ons vanavond allemaal saam gaan eet, Heere, beskerm ons, en ek pleid die bloed van Jesus oor een en elkeen wat hy is. En dankie dat hy ons God is, en dankie dat hy so ongelooflik lief is vir ons. Vra al die dinge net uit die genade uit. Amen. Bye, thank you, Rita. She refused uh, my mic because she has a direct line to God. So, um, Ladies and gents, for those of you who don't speak Afrikaans, Rita was praying for us. She asked for protection and a blessing on the conference. Rita, thank you very much. Ladies and gents, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to stage the chairperson, the chairman of the SIMAC board, Mr. P uh, Pieri Kronje. Thank you, Niku. I think Niku took my script last night, and um, you know he um, he actually wrote everything that he said to you from my script. So, um, so unfortunately, you'll have to listen to um, what he said now all over again, um, because it, it's my entire script, Niku. You 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 <laughs> great minds think alike, they say. So good morning to all of you. Um, I'm glad to see all of you here. It's such a privilege to welcome you to our 2021. Um, SAMAC Day. Um, we've all been looking forward to this. And, and, and in September, when we were faced with the difficulty, you know, of are we going to go ahead with a, with a conference? Are we going to change it to a virtual conference again? Or are we going to wait a little bit? Um, we took a step in faith um, to move it to November. And with our current level one regulations, you know, we are allowed to have this many people in the room. Um, so, you know, we, we're very glad that you all pitched up um, today to, to come and, and, and enjoy this event with us. So, um, we are pleased to have over 360 people um, present here in the room today. And we have over 120 people joining us virtually um, to this conference. I think that's a massive achievement. And we're, we, we're very proud of, of that achievement. Outside... People that are not in the room, there's another 110 people outside, you know, um, as part of the exhibitions outside. So in total, almost 600 people that is attending our, our day. So you know, we, a great um, thank you to Lizelle and her team for putting all of this together. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your diaries. I know that's always something that, um, that, that you have to do on the farm. I don't know who's looking after the farm today because, you know, you brought your teams with to come and join us here. So hopefully everything is going well there. Um, and, and I believe in our program today, there will be something for everybody um, that you can take away. I, I think it's very relevant topics for the time that we are in. And, um, and I think, you know, the panel discussions is, is going to be of, of some interest to all of you. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, Dirk Ace from Bayers and Dani Maria from F&B. Um, for sponsoring um, this day, our main sponsors, um, and a big thank you to the 41 exhibitors that are outside, um, you know, that's making it interesting for all of you. When you walk out of here and you're tired of what we are talking about here, you know, go and visit them at their stalls. I think um, there's, there's also something for everybody to see out there. Let me introduce the SAMAC team to you. Um, they're standing there um, on the side, all dressed up in their, in their blue shirts. Um, so Lizelle Pretorius, Lizelle is here, she's not dressed up in, in, in blue, but um, I, I think most of you know Lizelle, but maybe Lizelle, you can just quickly stand up here in the front. Um, Skulk Skuman, I saw Skulk here, there is Skulk, um, he's sitting on that side because he's going to do um, the, the chairing of the next session. Eurita, you've all seen Eurita earlier in the morning, she's standing there right at the back. Then John Ray, where's, where's John Ray? Um, I don't see John Ray right now. Um, but John Ray is, is also um, here, yeah, Nadira, no, yes, Nadira right here, and then they also assisted um, by Marnie. 
um, and Daru and Sue. Um, if you need any help, any guidance throughout the day, you know, please um, just make contact with them and they will um, assist you. Um, and then in Levubu, where we have 110 people at one location um, to, for the virtual streaming, um, we have Zafazeka that's um, um, assisting the team out there in, in Levubu. So it's great to see that there's so many people that um, asked us to create a separate venue for them. Um, and welcome to all of you um, that, that's there in Levubu. And then obviously, like Nico said, welcome to all the people that's present um, virtually. 2020 and 2021 uh, proved to be two challenging years for business and all of us. With the ongoing pandemic, the recent unrest and looting that happened and that plagued our country, um, and then the transnet cyber attack that happened. Each one of us knows someone who was affected by these events. Despite these challenging times, Macadamia farmers and processors remain fierce in producing and exporting a good quality crop with an estimate that um, 54,000 tons produced this season. Down from what we originally thought was going to be 60,000 tons. As a relatively new industry, the industry continues to grow at a rapid pace with an estimated 50,000 hectares established already. Approximately 30% of these hectares are not yet in production. The impact of climate change, pest pressures, agricultural practices, all of these continue to affect production and quality. It is no surprise then that roughly 50% of our SAMAC levy income is allocated to research activities, which is currently relatively evenly spread between crop production and crop protection in terms of rent spent. As the South African and the global macadamia industry continues to grow, rapid production increases as predicted for the foreseeable future. Samak through our CEO, Lazelle, and our commercial director, Miles Osborne, worked tirelessly in the beginning of the year towards the establishment of the World Macadamia Organization. The aim with the World Macadamia Organization, or WMO, is to stimulate and grow demand ahead of the production supply. To this end, the WMO will launch its first non-origin market campaign in China later this year. And Jillian Lang, the founding CEO of the WMO will join us virtually from New Zealand later in, in our um, day. Um, I heard that it is going to be half past two in the morning in New Zealand. So if she looks a little bit tired, you know why. We also want to thank the growers for the continued support through the levy contribution. The levy income enabled us to make great strides in building our administrative capacity increasing our research, market development, and transformation capacity, and enabled us to contribute towards some specific projects, such as the production benchmark, aiming at providing our members with valuable information, and you will hear a little bit more about that later on. Details of all of these activities are available in the SAMEC journal, um, which you all received this morning as part of your, the pack that you, that you received. The current levy cycle comes to an end in November 2022, and we will in due course engage with our growers in various provinces regarding the renewal of this levy. Lastly, I would like to make use of this opportunity to thank the board who initiated this day and congratulate Lizelle and her team for the outstanding work that they have done in putting this day together. Without your foresight, initiative and perseverance, this day would not have been possible. We are looking forward to the various presentations throughout the day and invite you to share your thoughts and ask your questions during the panel discussions that will follow um, each one of the presentations. In his book, Good to Great, Jim Collins concludes as follows. Greatness is not a function of circumstance. Greatness, it turns out, is largely a matter of conscious choice and then discipline. 
I trust that you will find something in today's program that will help you to make a conscious choice that will take you from good to great. Because good is the enemy of great. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this day with us. Say no, does say no, does say. Piri bye, Nanki, for thy, uh, thy opening. Thank you for that uh, opening and welcome, sir. Um, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, or our, our main keynote speaker of the day. He's a professional futurist with a, a keen understanding of the elements and factors that determine the probable outcomes of current events to be able to plan for the future. His aim is not only to give us a glimpse of what is to come, but also what role we can play in that envisioned, envisioned future. Ladies and gents, please welcome Guy Lundy. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'm very relieved to know that uh, Nico pronounced my name correctly because that means that I don't have to say his whole name. <laughs> Thanks very much to everyone for being here. It's really fantastic to have an opportunity to stand in front of a group like this again for the first time in uh, almost two years and uh, to have so many people who are able to interact um, as, as openly and easily as, they, as you are today. So you heard that I'm a professional futurist. It's, it's what I do. I look at what's happening today in order to get some idea of what's likely to happen going forward. I don't know a lot about macadamias other than that they are my favorite nut. So when I eat mixed nuts, I always leave the macadamias till the end because they're the best. Uh, and of course, the trees are fantastic for sleeping under when I do the sign to see mountain bike race. But beyond that, it's about as much as I know. So what I'm going to be focusing on today is really more around the broader future, the world that we operate in, uh, and helping you get an understanding of some of the things that are likely to take place, likely to happen, so that you can plan for what that future holds. So looking at South Africa and the world towards 2030, I think it helps us to look back um, to, to start with. And I want to introduce you to the concept of long waves, otherwise known as Kondratiev's waves. And they're called Kondratius waves, named after a Soviet economist back in the 1930s who was tasked by Stalin to go and look at and prove that capitalism was dead. What he did, unfortunately for him, was that he showed that capitalism was not dead, which of course led to Kondratiev himself soon thereafter being dead because Stalin didn't like the answer. But what he found was that if he looked back to from the start of the Industrial Revolution, he found that at that point, there'd been around three major waves driven by major technologies, starting with steam power back with the Industrial Revolution, followed by railways um, through the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, and then with the wave that he was currently in at that time, electricity, the, the, the growth of electricity and the spread of motor vehicles. Of course, these waves are, are characterized by significant growth then a, a peak where it sort of falls off and then you have another period of growth and then a big drop, which back in his time happened around the Second World War. So you get to the bottom of a wave and it's a very uncomfortable place to be. So if we look at where we are today at the wave that we're currently in or have been in over the last 40 to 60 years, because that's about how long these waves take, we find that our most recent wave has been driven by computers and computer software and we've gone through a big growth period post the Second World War through the 1950s, 1960s. We had that come off in the 1970s with the oil crisis. Then through the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, we had what was the equivalent of the roaring 20s before the Second World War. And then, of course, come 2008, we hit the ground. We came to the bottom of the wave. So where we find ourselves at the moment is at the bottom of one of these long waves. Now, that's a very uncomfortable place to be, but it also gives us the ability to start taking advantage of the next wave. And the bottom of the wave doesn't happen once off. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a period of time. And I want to show you, if you don't believe that we're sitting at the bottom of the wave, what it looks like in South Africa's business confidence over the last 10 years or 13 years since 2008. 
If you look at the business confidence since it was started being tracked by the Bureau of Economic Research in the mid-1970s, you can see that it's been very up and down. So classically, sort of 1976, the Soweto riots uh, coincided with the oil crisis. Then 1980, very high gold price. 1985, the Rubicon speech, the state of emergency, etc. So very up and down events that have caused things to either become very happy or very unhappy. Here you can see a little peak in 1995. We won the Rugby World Cup that year, um, which, believe it or not, does have an impact on business confidence. And then, of course, 2008, big crash. And since then, it's been the bottom of a wave. So it's an uncomfortable place to be. People don't enjoy it. And it leads to social consequences. So if you look at what ha tends to happen at the bottom of a wave, we have a social backlash that takes place. And this is what we're feeling at the moment. So you can feel the, the backlash against the traditional establishment. Just one example of this would be the gender issues that, uh, that I constantly get faced with having teenage children. Uh, if I forget to call people by the right pronoun, uh, I get uh, a significant backlash because I can't, you know, I'm, I'm 51 years old. How the hell am I supposed to remember to call someone uh, Z or it or they or whatever it happens to be? And the second thing that happens is political instability. So if we look for the last five, six years around the world, there has been significant political instability. There's been political instability here in South Africa. Donald Trump, now Joe Biden, who's come in, he's, of course, within his first six months, lost significant support. So stability all around the world is very much in question when you're at the bottom of the wave as we are. Also, you have social unrest. Remember the George Floyd riots that took place in the United States last year? Very similar to the riots that we had here in South Africa this year. So we many, very often think that we are unique and that these problems that we're experiencing are just us, but actually the type of social unrest that we've experienced in this country in the last few months is mirrored around the world by people with different problems, different issues that kick off that social unrest in their particular countries. And then independence movements always kick off during periods like this. And it's not only at the bottom of the wave, it's also during downturns. You'll remember in the 1970s, the Quebecois wanted to break away from, Ca from Canada. The, uh, you know, the, the, the Basques wanted to break away from Spain. Now we've got Britain breaking away from the EU. We've got Scotland wanting to break away from the UK. Uh, we've got Tigray wanting to break away from Ethiopia. So you see this stuff growing where you have significant downturns. But of course, what you also have is you have a growth in hope because people have a drive to want to get out of this messy situation. You do, of course, have a significant growth in wishful thinking in many cases. So here you'll see I've got a couple of the superhero movies that have uh, been very, very popular over the last 10 years. There were something like 21 uh, Avengers-related movies. It's been the biggest grossing genre in the movie industry over the last 12 years. And that's because people are looking for someone to rescue them from the mess that they find themselves in. And if you look back at the 1930s, that's when the genre started. Superman was written in 1938. He was followed quite shortly thereafter by Batman and Captain America, etc. So it shows you that we think that we're unique. This is the period that we live in at the moment. But very often, it's stuff that has happened before, and it's quite predictable. So, of course, if you look at those things that have driven these waves and we find ourselves at the bottom of a wave, what is it that's likely to take us through into the next wave and the next period of significant growth? And my view is that the next wave is going to be driven by sustainability, a focus on sustainability. And I'm not just talking about climate. I'm talking about everything related to it. So climate is obviously a key driver. People are very aware of the fact that the climate is changing. But it's also about food and food production. The population of the world continues to grow. We need to continue to feed them. So the sustainability is also very much around how do we produce enough food for the people that we're going to have? How do we ensure that we have health for the people that we have? And of course, with the last two years with COVID, it's put it very much front and center in terms of health sustainability. Power, the generation of electricity and the ability to keep these lights going. Transport, rather than focusing on diesel and all of that sort of thing, how do we move away from fossil fuels in terms of transport? 
So if you look, for example, a company like PepsiCo, one of the biggest food producers in the world, have ordered 100 Tesla trucks so that they can start using electric trucks to deliver their product rather than the traditional trucks. And then, of course, buildings. How do we keep buildings more sustainable? So these are all areas that are focused on people being focusing on these areas from around the world, looking at how do we make things better uh, as far as sustainability is concerned. And it drives a tremendous amount of technological growth where you have such a big focus on something like this, very much like through the, the 50s and 60s, the Cold War and the race to get to the moon drove so much technological innovation. We're going to experience the same thing during this current uh, and, and future wave as we go into it. And I think there are three major factors in that. The one is biotechnology. So particularly around COVID, we've seen a tremendous amount of work going into health and biotechnology around that. This, by the way, is a picture of Dolly the sheep. You may remember her. She was cloned in 1996. We didn't even have Internet Explorer in 1996, but we cloned a sheep 25 years ago. So if you look at 25 years of biotechnological research subsequent to that, you can only begin to imagine how far we've advanced since then as far as biotechnology is concerned. Similarly with nanotechnology, the science of the very, very small. Did you know that Microsoft's first operating system worked on four kilobytes? That was the size of their entire operating system. Today, my phone has 256 gigabytes in it. So the, the ability to fit more and more stuff into sm smaller and smaller spaces means that we can do so many things. For example, you can put something that size that monitors every single tree on your farm and you can understand exactly what's happening with that tree in a way that was never possible before. And bringing all of that together is the artificial intelligence that takes data from all of those trees, from the weather systems, from satellite imagery, etc and brings it all together and makes sense of it and feeds you with information that you can then utilize. So this combination of technologies enables us to drive more and more technology towards uh, that work that's going on with sustainability. So a massive opportunity for us as we go into this wave that we're about to kick off. I think one of the things around sustainability that's worth noting is that there is going to be, and there already is, a big focus on local procurement. Of course, when you move into a wave, there are threats and opportunities. One of the potential threats is that I think much of your crop is exported, and you will start to see people around the world looking at the opportunities that you guys have shown is possible in your industry here, and wanting to start to do the same elsewhere more and more, and then feed their local market more and more uh, from a much more local base. So something to keep uh, to keep in mind, uh, and also focusing on the fact that because you export so far and you use so much resource in order to get your product there, how do you start to deal with that particular issue? Um, one example of an agricultural company based here in South Africa that has done uh, interesting work around that is Westphalia in the avocado business. They've moved into markets all over the world and have started growing and have started buying companies that grow in other markets so that they don't have to be reliant on exporting from here. Today, the second biggest producer of avocados in the world, grown out of South Africa. So a very interesting example that we can look at from moving pr production from just here to also having interests elsewhere around the world as well. And as we look around the world, one of the things that is definitely has been going on for some time but continues to happen is the power that is shifting towards the east. So obviously with the vast majority of the world's population being based in the east, we're seeing a growth in terms of economic power in that area as well. And China particularly leading the way. So before COVID, China was already driving a big growth, um, growth focus on the Pacific Rim. So parts of Africa, parts of Asia, through into Europe with their One Belt, One Road initiative. Big focus coming out of China into investing in this area, not just in China itself. And of course, we in South Africa currently, the official uh, look at, at One Belt, One Road kind of looks at central and, and further north in terms of Africa. We need to be making sure that we're a part of that as well down here in South Africa. 
So a focus on the east is definitely something that if you're not doing it and you're not looking for opportunities in that part of the world, you are going to miss out. The other thing that's happening as we move forward and, and we, we look at how the world is changing is that there is a, there's a growing, disappearing middle. I talk about the disappearing middle because the middle is starting to, to disappear at many levels. So for example, if you look in organizations, when you start to have a cutback like we've had recently, where you start to see people being furloughed, people being laid off, it tends to be the middle management. It tends to be the supervisors of the people doing the work rather than the executives or the people at the bottom. So your, your middle management within organizations is starting to be shifted out, and where they cut is in that middle, and so organizations are getting smaller and smaller and utilizing technology more and more in order to be able to supervise the work that people are doing, rather than growing the numbers of people. At the same time, organizations themselves are also becoming significantly larger or significantly smaller. So what you've got is you've got companies like these, Nestle, PepsiCo, Unilever, Kellogg's, Mondelez, etc., that control the vast majority of food production, at least branded food production uh, around the world in many different ways. And then you've got niche products that are starting to fall out of those sorts of organizations. So where your middle manager gets shifted aside, he or she then goes and starts something small. Uh, and you end up with a Nestle, et cetera, versus a Future Life, for example, if you were to look at that cereal industry. So you're starting to see smaller, or at least a smaller number of very large organizations and a large number of very small organizations. Those middle-sized organizations are becoming less and less common. So an interesting change that's taking place there and one to think about in terms of your own organizations as well. How we will live is also an interesting um, an interesting thing to consider. And the reason that I have here a picture of Tokyo is because this is likely to be more and more common. Tokyo, one of the biggest cities in the world, 25 odd million people. Uh, and you'll see around the world more and more of these mega cities being developed. And the major reason for it is because there is growing urbanization. So people from the rural areas where your farms are wanting to move into the cities the rural areas all over the world are becoming less and less populated and the cities are becoming more and more populated. So cities become bigger and bigger. One of the challenges with that, of course, is that cities started as towns, which started as villages, which started as farms. And so most cities are based in areas where you've got quite arable land. And so as a result, your amount of arable land around that city becomes less and less. We see this in places like uh, Cape Town, where many of the wine farms have now become developed uh, areas. Um, so it is something that we need to take account of is that the fact that 20 million people living in a city like this cannot feed themselves. They need to be fed. So your industry continues to remain very, very important to sustainability of those cities. Um, just looking at the population and the population growth, one of the things that many people worry about with population is that we are likely to grow beyond all recognition. But the reality is that we are likely to plateau around 2050 at a population of around 9 billion. We're currently sitting at about 7.5 billion. So we've still got a lot of people between now and 25 years from now, but we are likely to plateau at that number. The major difference, of course, is that the number of people, the percentage of those people that live in cities is going to be around 70% by 2050. So very, very urbanized population around the world of people, as I say, who don't produce food. Looking at Africa, you can see that there's significant growth expected. We are likely to go from about a billion people at the moment to about 2 billion people by 2050. Uh, so about double the population. And you can see in many of these countries here, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, DRC, uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, that are likely to see more than doubling of their populations. So big, big growth in Africa. And we can expect to see more North Africans here in South Africa, because one of the interesting things is that here, you can see that South Africa's population growth is actually relatively low. And the major reason for that is because we are already urbanized, and people in cities have fewer children. There's more for them to do at night, that sort of stuff. <laughs> of course, one of the interesting things is that with the growth of technology, we can expect to see the growth of second cities. And in a, in a country like South Africa, we're already seeing it. 
two of the fastest growing areas in the country, Belito outside Durban, Franschhoek outside Cape Town, and then you look at others like Port Elizabeth, George, St. Francis outside Port Elizabeth, Bloemfontein, Peter Maritzburg, Nelspreet. People are choosing to move to these smaller cities because they're less crowded. Of course, the ones that win will be the ones that, be that provide the best for those people. So expect to see many of those places that we consider to be small towns to become much bigger towns and potentially second cities in the country. And then I want to end off with, the, with how the youth will experience life. And this is really, for me, very important because they are the leaders of the future. So the kids that are teenagers today are going to be sitting in these seats in 20 years' time and making the decisions around your industry. It's not going to be us. So there are a couple of factors. One is that they are less worried about privacy. If you look at TikTok and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and all of the rest of it, they live online. So they're less worried about whether... They, whether they are being private or not. They also, as a result, expect to be understood. They expect you to know what they want and why they want it. They are also more connected to each other, to the rest of the world, and of course, to their own family. So the teenagers of today are more connected to their parents than we could ever have hoped to have been back in the 1970s, 80s, etc., and largely because of technology. But because of all of this, they also experience significantly more competition. So anyone who has kids that are in grade 11, grade 12 at the moment will know the amount of stress that they go through because the pressure is on them to do well because of the competition that they face, not only within their own school, but in the world. So they are experiencing a lot more competition. And as a result, they are more anxious and more serious than the youth have been in the past. And just looking at a couple of these graphs here. This comes from the World Health Organization, and it shows a study that gets done every five years to see the behavior of the youth. And you can see here of those people, for example, that have been drunk at least twice. These are 15-year-olds. You can see in the OECD countries has dropped steadily since the 1990s. Those that have had sex by the age of 15 has dropped steadily since the 1990s. And very encouragingly, those that find it easy to talk to their fathers has steadily increased. Now, this is all very relevant to me since I have a 15-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter, and I'm very happy to see these statistics. <laughs> and so I want to end off really with this message is teach your children well, and there are a couple of skills that they will need in order to survive in this world. And I think it's skills that you can apply in your businesses as well. The first one is creativity and innovation. What separates us from the machines that we are designing is consciousness. We are creative, we are innovative, we are the ones that come up with the ideas. We use the machines to implement them. So encourage creativity and innovation. Encourage empathy, because people will use machines, but they are not machines. We always think that we're going to go and have a robot that dispenses pills when we're sick. We won't, because actually what we want is a human being to feel what we feel and understand what we are going through. And then agility, never stop learning. And that's a message to everyone in this room. The world is changing continuously. We've got to continue to learn and grow. And then finally, we've got to develop compassion. Because as I mentioned, that disappearing middle, there's a growing divide that's, that's growing within the world. And we need to find ways in order to reduce the growing divide. So compassion is as important as the rest of them. And with that, I've run out of time. And I'd love to wish you all a very happy day, Macadamia Day. Enjoy yourselves, and thank you very much for having me.